They sit at opposite ends of our planet, two frozen frontiers that define the limits of life on Earth. The Arctic in the north, the Antarctic in the south, both are wrapped in ice, battered by wind, and ruled by silence. Yet, they could not be more different. Why is one of them, the Arctic, home to millions of people, thriving towns, and even reindeer herders, while the other, the Antarctic, remains an untouched wilderness with not a single permanent resident? What makes one a frozen ocean and the other a frozen continent? And how could melting ice in either place reshape every coastline on the planet? In this journey, we'll unravel the science behind their extremes, why the South freezes harder, how melting ice changes the world's oceans, and what keeps life alive under the northern cold. Let's begin. At first glance, the poles might look the same, endless white stretching beyond the horizon, but beneath that ice lies the single biggest difference of all. The Arctic isn't land at all, it's ocean. A frozen sea known as the Arctic Ocean, the smallest of Earth's five oceans, about 14 million square kilometers. Its surface freezes over each winter, forming a sheet of drifting sea ice that melts and reforms with the seasons. Beneath that ice lies salt water, deep and alive, helping the region hold a bit of its heat. The Antarctic, on the other hand, is solid ground. It's a continent buried beneath thousands of meters of ice, a slab of land locked under snow so thick it hides entire mountain ranges. Even their names tell the story. Arctic comes from the ancient Greek Arctos, meaning bear, a nod to the northern constellations, the Great and Little Bear. Antarctic simply means the opposite of the Arctic. And that difference, ocean versus continent, changes everything. Water stores and releases heat, so the Arctic's ocean helps soften the cold. But land traps it, and the high, dry plateau of Antarctica turns that cold into something far more brutal. Both are frozen, yes, but one breathes with the sea while the other stands silent and still. So why is the Antarctic so much harsher than the Arctic? Three powerful reasons, all written into its landscape. First, altitude. Most of Antarctica sits on a high plateau, blanketed by ice that rises two and a half to three kilometers above sea level. The higher you go, the thinner the air and the colder it gets. That alone makes the continent far more frigid than anything in the north. Second, isolation. The Antarctic is surrounded by a massive unbroken ring of wind and current called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, or ACC. It's the strongest current system on Earth, a cold barrier that spins endlessly around the continent, cutting it off from the warmer oceans to the north. No other place on the planet is this sealed off from the rest of the world's climate. And third, the surface itself. Ice and snow reflect most of the sunlight that reaches them, a phenomenon called albedo. Instead of absorbing warmth, the Antarctic bounces it straight back into space. Combine that with its dry, thin air, and you get a place so cold it can reach 89 Arctis, the lowest natural temperature ever recorded on Earth. That's why Antarctica isn't just colder than the Arctic, it's the coldest place on the planet. But cold is only part of the story, because when ice begins to melt, it doesn't just change the poles, it changes the sea level of the entire world. When people hear the Arctic is melting, most imagine oceans rising overnight and cities disappearing beneath the waves. But the truth is a little more complex. Here's what really happens. The Arctic is mostly sea ice, frozen ocean water already floating on the surface. So when it melts, the water level hardly changes at all. It's the same principle that keeps your drink from overflowing when the ice cubes melt. Archimedes figured it out long ago. An object floating in water displaces exactly its own weight. But just next door lies Greenland, a massive island covered by an ice sheet over three kilometers thick in places. That's solid land ice. And if it ever melted completely, global sea levels could rise by about seven meters. Then there's the Antarctic, the true giant. Its continental ice holds nearly 60 meters worth of potential sea level rise. 
Fortunately, that kind of melting would take thousands of years. But even small changes today are already measurable along our coastlines. So, while shrinking sea ice is a warning sign for climate change, it's not what floods the world's shores. The real danger comes from the land ice, the frozen water locked in Greenland and Antarctica. And yet, even in a world defined by ice and cold, life still finds a way. Which brings us to the next question. How can millions of people survive in the Arctic when almost no one can stay in the South? It might seem impossible, but the Arctic isn't empty. In fact, across its frozen coasts and tundra plains, millions of people live, work, and raise families. Eight nations share this northern world, Canada, the United States through Alaska, Russia, Norway, Denmark through Greenland, Iceland, Finland, and Sweden. Together they form what's known as the Arctic region, a patchwork of ice, islands, and small cities that hug the edge of the polar circle. Here, communities have adapted for thousands of years. The Inuit, Yupik, and Inupia peoples of North America and Greenland, the Sami of northern Scandinavia and Russia, these are cultures built on endurance. Their lives revolve around the rhythm of ice and migration. Fishing in summer, hunting seals and whales, herding reindeer across the snowfields. Their homes are insulated with snow or animal hides. Their traditions pass down through stories and song, teach respect for the land that both gives and takes. Modern towns now dot the Arctic too. Mining settlements in Siberia, ports in Alaska and Norway, scientific stations across Greenland. Oil, gas and mineral exploration have brought roads and industry but also conflict between progress and preservation. Many Arctic peoples now balance ancient customs with modern challenges, from climate change to cultural survival. Meanwhile, at the other end of the Earth, the Antarctic tells a completely different story. There are no villages, no families, no permanent citizens at all. Instead, more than 70 research stations stand scattered across the frozen continent run by scientists from dozens of nations. These temporary residents live under the Antarctic Treaty, signed in 1959, which declares the continent a zone of peace and science. Mining and military activity are banned. Every project here must serve discovery, not domination. So while the North hosts a living culture, the South remains humanity's laboratory, a mirror for what happens when Earth is left untouched but survival here isn't just about people, because in the Arctic, there's another kind of resident, one that wears a coat of white, hunts in silence, and rules the ice. Every world has its symbol, and at the poles, those symbols couldn't be more distinct. In the Arctic, the undisputed ruler is the polar bear, the largest land carnivore on Earth. It spends most of its life on drifting sea ice, roaming vast distances in search of its main prey, seals. Yet even for such a powerful hunter, survival isn't easy. Scientists estimate that fewer than two out of every hundred hunts succeed. Each kill can mean the difference between life and death. Its adaptations are remarkable. The bear's fur isn't white at all. Each hair is transparent, hollow, and reflects light, creating that snow-white glow. Beneath it lies black skin, designed to soak in the faint warmth of the Arctic sun. But this brilliance is fragile. Without sea ice to stand on, polar bears lose the very platform they depend on to hunt, rest, and breed. At the other end of the planet, a very different creature thrives, the penguin. These flightless birds belong only to the southern hemisphere, and the greatest colonies live in Antarctica. They waddle, dive, and endure months of darkness and freezing winds, perfectly built for the cold. But don't confuse them with Arctic penguins. That's a myth. The so-called northern penguin was actually the great Ayuk, a seabird that once lived in the North Atlantic and went extinct in the 19th century after relentless hunting. Two poles two symbols. One walks upon floating ice, the other slides across frozen land, each shaped by its geography, each a mirror of its environment. And while these animals represent survival in its purest form, 
the Arctic itself has become a proving ground for something else entirely, human innovation and the race to conquer the ice. For centuries, the Arctic was a place few dared to cross, a map's blank space filled with storms, ice, and mystery. But today, it's becoming one of the most strategic frontiers on Earth. As the ice retreats each summer, new sea routes begin to open, especially the Northern Sea Route, a corridor along Russia's Arctic coast that can cut the journey between Europe and Asia by nearly half. To navigate this shifting maze of ice, Russia has built the world's largest fleet of nuclear-powered icebreakers, some over 170 meters long and capable of slicing through ice nearly three meters thick. These steel giants keep shipping lanes open, carry research expeditions, and project power across a region once sealed off by nature itself. But the Arctic isn't just about industry and ambition, it's also home to one of humanity's most remarkable safeguards for the future. Hidden deep inside a mountain on the Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard lies the Global Seed Vault, often called the Doomsday Vault. Built in 2008, this underground chamber sits 120 meters inside solid rock and permafrost, protected from war, rising seas, and natural disasters. Inside are more than one million seed samples from nearly every country on Earth, a backup library of life itself designed to preserve the world's crops if disaster ever strikes. And outside, during the Arctic summer, another wonder unfolds, the midnight sun. For about 125 days from April to August, the sun never sets over Svalbard. Daylight lingers through the night, turning the snowfields golden at midnight and bathing the Arctic in an endless glow. A land of contrasts, part laboratory, part trade route, part time capsule for humanity's future. Not everything about the Arctic is science and ice. Some parts feel like pure magic. For generations, children across the world have lifted their eyes toward the far north, imagining that somewhere beyond the snowdrifts and starlight lies Santa Claus. A cheerful old soul in a red coat surrounded by reindeer and tireless elves preparing for one extraordinary night of miracles. In the world's imagination, his home sits squarely at the North Pole, the beating heart of the Arctic. But ask the people of Finland, and they'll gently shake their heads and point you toward Lapland, tucked high above the Arctic Circle, where pine forests shimmer under curtains of northern lights. There, Santa isn't just folklore. He's the spirit of winter itself, a warm presence in a world carved from ice. But beneath this beloved myth lies something much deeper, a human instinct to soften the world's harshest places with stories, hope, and wonder. We give the cold a heartbeat, and we give the Arctic a face. But when we peel back the magic and look at the science, what truly separates the planet's two poles? It comes down to one striking contrast. The Arctic is a living ocean capped with ice surrounded by people, cultures, and constant change. The Antarctic is a silent, frozen continent, a realm of science, solitude, and untouched wilderness. From space, they look similar. Up close, they're worlds apart. And when it comes to rising seas, remember this. It's not the floating sea ice that threatens our coastlines, but the massive sheets of land ice in Greenland and Antarctica. That's where the real story of climate change is unfolding. So tell me, over the next 30 years, what do you think will reshape Arctic life the most? The opening of summer shipping routes, the race for minerals and energy, or the steady, relentless melt of the ice itself? Share your thoughts in the comment. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss the next deep dive into the hidden frontiers of our planet.